There we go. We're live now. Um, okay, Marcy's saying she can't get into the YouTube link from the classroom. Um, okay, I'm gonna put. I'm gonna set it back for public. Okay. Maybe that's why. Hmm. I had changed the settings and. Um, but if you have the link, it should work fine. Uh, let me check in with Marcy. Okay. We'll wait for, well, and we can also see as people join, so. And I'll, maybe I'll grab my phone and try to join from there. Okay. See what's going on. Okay, so one person watching, so somebody's on. Check in with Marcy. Okay. Okay. We'll wait for a little, and we can also see as people join. So, <laughs> all right, um, uh, you can probably hear, I don't know if you can hear that on my computer, the echo. And I'll, maybe I'll grab my phone and try to join from there. Okay. You can hear the echo? Okay. So it's, it's the, I'm seeing, I'm seeing like, it's like I time travel back a couple minutes. Okay, we've got five people joining. So I think it's working now. Okay, hi everybody. If somebody could do me a favor and um, put, um, just, uh, uh, put a comment in the comment section just so I can uh, make sure that we're seeing your comments. That would be wonderful. And um, I will uh, I will uh, write a comment as well and make sure that you guys can see me. So let's see. Um, and if you and if it's not working, I'll I'll do comments. I'll I'll grab it from my phone. Sometimes it says I can't. Oh, no, that's working. Okay, great. So we'll wait for some comments. And I think we can go ahead and get started, um, In you know, at least with the introduction. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm going to pop off and just be behind the scenes and kind of make sure everything's running that way. Um, but it looks like we've got some folks joining, and um, I'll make sure everybody else can join as, as we go along. Okay. Thank you, Jen. <sighs> So hi everyone, hi again. We had a session this morning um, and now we have uh, some interviews and then we're gonna cook a little bit later. Um, so we have Marty Wolfson here. Um, Marty and I met a couple of years ago, two or three years ago at our local farmer's market. Um, she was doing- Sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna join back again. I have one more person who's saying that they're having some issues joining. Okay. So I'm, I'm, um, I'll stay on for a second. Um, okay. It's nice to have it turning out. Yeah. Oh, okay. I do have people joining now. So I think we're good. Okay. Catherine's here and Javier is here and Dana has joined as well. Okay. And let me just see um, if. Okay. So she got through searching in YouTube. Let me do. Um, let me do one thing, which is I will, I'm gonna go grab it, the link from YouTube and just make sure that the, the link is updated properly. Um, if, okay. Okay, I'm gonna just put that in the classroom. So just bear with me for one more second. And hello everybody, thanks for your patience as we get some technical difficulties sorted out, but I think we're close. Um, You know what I will do? Actually, I'm going to send an email to everybody. I'll do it that way. In case it's better. Okay. Um, it looks like Shoshana got in as well. Okay. I think people are ready. So I'm going to just um, do this one email just to make sure for anybody else who might be having an issue. And then I think we can start. Okay. All right, I'm saying goodbye again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so hello everyone. I'm glad more of you joined. Um, and we have Marty Wolfson here. Um, Marty and I met a few years ago in our local farmer's market. Um, she was doing a demo at the farmer's market. 
and I was doing also like a quick demo cooking class for kids that same day. Um, and we discovered that we're neighbors and we have a lot of shared interests. Um, and I always, I love to hear um, Marty's ideas for recipes. Um, and she's been teaching a teen class at Fiddleheads Cooking Studio and she has so much other stuff going on with her own business. Um, so yeah. Hi, Marty. It's so nice Hi. to meet you. <laughs> Thank you so much for the invite. Yeah. Um, and we have also posted your TEDx talk uh, <laughs> for the teachers. So some of them have also seen that or are going to see it. It's one of the things that they have to do for today. Um, but I wanted to start with a, a different question. Um, so how, why did you uh, decide to become a chef? How was that a, a process or that something, you know, something that you always loved cooking and you thought you're, this is the profession for you? How, how did that go? Wow, um, it was definitely a process. And I would love to say it was, an ac it was kind of an accident, um, but nothing really is, right? <laughs> I mean, I think all roads led to it. Yeah. Um, my first career was in movement therapy. I was a very serious Pilates and gyrotonic teacher. Gyrotonic is a little I more things about you. Okay. Gyro, I know gyrotonic is a little less known, but it's in that vein of of conditioning as Pilates, and um, and I was a serious dancer, so <clears throat> I was very much into um, anatomy and science, and always into wellness. And I guess the bridge between that, you know, I kind of, I phased out of it. I got tired of, of teaching in that way. And during that time, I was really healing myself from really, really bad chronic gut dysfunction. Um, and nobody was helping me at that time. I mean, in the gastroenterology world, it was just hit you with medication and medication. Nobody was talking about elimination diets like we do today yeah. food is medicine and i was lucky enough to be teaching my movement therapy at canyon ranch in the berkshires yeah which was really the first resort and spa that had functional medicine and that might be an unfamiliar term for some people so functional medicine is actually um an institute that certifies doctors and other people and other medical professionals in this um, medical system called functional medicine, which really gets to the root of health problems through food and diet and lifestyle changes. And I was really in there with the pioneers that we, you might have heard of today, like the Mark Hyman's of the world. And yeah. I was learning from them. I was able in between my Pilates sessions to go and learn from them. And I actually sat across from Mark Hyman and he was talking to me about eliminating inflammatory foods huh. so and i started to go that, just so we have some perspective when was that? that that was like 2004 2003 okay. 2004 yeah so yeah about you know 16 years ago and i was like 23 at the time and i would just go back to my little apartment kitchen and start to experiment yeah. with you know kind of like partial elimination diets and i ended up doing like every diet you could imagine. I mean, by the time I, you know, over, over a course of years and I started to heal, I really started to see what happened if I took out gluten, if I took out dairy and I wasn't doing it in any systematic way, but I was seeing these results on a, a very inflammatory gut that I had. Um, so I, I started to play, I started to get more and more interested in food and, um, I ended up walking on a street one day and I picked up a brochure. I mean, I just looked down, I picked up a brochure and I turned to this page and it said the natural gourmet Institute. And it was just one of those moments. Like I have to do that. And literally in a couple of weeks I enrolled and I went to this, this Institute that is really the only one of its kind really in the world. And it was started by Anne Marie Colbin who established a health supportive culinary education. She did it out of her apartment in New York City way back in the seventies. And then she, she got her own space in the Flatiron District and it was there for 40 some years. They just 
closed, um, sadly, and they've been taken over ICE, the Institute of Culinary Education. But that was really like once I entered that, I found my my home and my groove, and I decided to kind of just zone in right on cancer patients and and helping cancer patients heal with food after I graduated and my career just kind of went from that. Yeah. Um, and you described that you had some, you know, um, uh, issues with different foods. Is it something that you've always had or did it develop in a, at a certain age, just out of interest, curiosity? You know, we say in functional medicine, um, and I say we, because I went and I got my master's in nutrition and functional medicine. So I've, I've been in the field really ever since that time of Canyon Ranch. Um, we say, you know, the, the, um, I'm just, I'm just losing the phrase, but it's like you load the gun early on. Yeah. And it's really how you pull the trigger with your lifestyle and your diet. So I think, I think things were set in place. Yeah. You know, I have a very type A, um, personality, um, there's always been anxiety. I, it's a dance, it's that dancer type A, yeah. you know, perfectionism that was yeah. always there and didn't know how to really kind of harness it in. Um, and then I got a parasite. So there was an actual physical trigger. Okay. So I got a parasite through something I ate and that just set things off. Yeah. Got it. And it's a, it can be a vicious cycle. Um, and so I really dreaded eat. I mean, it was like everything I ate would disturb me. Yeah. Um, and it just, it took a lot of discovery to figure out how to just quiet things down. Um, and now, and now I'm good, but it was years of suffering with that. Yeah. Um, well, in your talk, you, uh, you speak of intuition. Uh, and, and I love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I feel you know, I, I want to hear more about what you have to say about intuition in the kitchen because some people say, like, oh, I'm t I just can't cook. Right. I, I don't have that intuition. Right. Uh, but I, I definitely think that something that you can acquire by by testing things out and trying right. it. And so I wanted to see what if you can, you know, if you can elaborate on that point of intuition. You know, I chose to say, I was nervous, I'll tell you. I mean, honestly, I was nervous to talk about that on stage in a TEDx talk because it isn't talked a lot about. I mean, when we think about cooking, it's about this mastery, right? I mean, we're so programmed now to look at in the media, how it's delivered. And I think of it all as intuition. And this is what Anne Marie with the Natural Gourmet, I think, I think this is where I... I come from with it. She was like really our grandmother about this, that it's so ancestral cooking. Yeah. It's so human. And the TEDx talk was about the pursuit of happiness. That was the theme. Yeah. And there's so much research actually that the more intuitive, um, that intuitive thinkers, there's a strong correlation to happiness, to greater happiness. And you just think about like, you know, even if you're not, you don't think of yourself as an intuitive cook, like think about if you've gotten into the kitchen and you made something, I don't know, just on a whim and how it made you, like, it makes you feel really good and warm inside. Yeah. Or we all talk about like our mother, or our grandmother, or our grandfather's cooking, right? Yeah. It was probably intuitive and it makes us feel so good too. So there's this like, transmission of, <laughs> of that yeah. happiness. Right. And that's what I try to get people inspired by is like how to get in there and practice so that it does just become more natural. You don't have to think about it so much. Right. Or you don't have to be anxious about following a recipe. Exactly. Right. Says. And if you don't have that, then you, you know, you can't make the whole thing. It's just about right. learning how the different ingredients, you know, what, what uh, role they play in that specific yeah. dish. And yeah, understanding it. Yeah, and how they go together. And um, I have this wonderful colleague. She's such a dear friend of mine, Rebecca Katz. And I really learned this balance of flavor. I started to learn it from her books because she has this acronym called FAS, F-A-S-S, -S, which stands for fat, acid, sweet, and salt. And if you carry that 
you know, if you really kind of make that your checks and balance, yeah. And you think about, okay, like waking up vinaigrette, you need a fat, you need some kind of acid, right. you know, some kind of saltiness, whether it's sea salt or soy sauce right. and, and a sweetness, you're there. You just have yeah. to taste and play. Right. Right. Um, but not everybody has that, it, especially if you weren't taught it. You right. know, a lot of, I, I hear that a lot from clients when I work one-on-one, -on -one. it's like, my mother never cooked. I was never taught this. Right. Well, yeah, you've got some learning to do. <laughs> some yeah. Experimenting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you brought up the, the F-A-S-S, -S, uh, which, of course, reminds me of Samina Strat's uh, book of salt right. and fat heat. Same, same, uh, thing, same idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, I remember when I first read the book, I was, you know, I felt like everything she wrote there, I, I was like, exactly. You know, yes. <laughs> this is where. Yeah, I it's the foundation. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so so I think that people that cook more and have been taught how to cook um, by intuition just follow that line. Um, right. But it doesn't mean that if you weren't taught, you can't become a cook yourself or an intuitive cook. No, no, and I and I also think this is why I talk so much about seasonality, eating with the seasons, um, because this is also where cooking was so much more intuitive when we were living closer you know to farms we were cooking from farm fresh food as just a way of life you know now we talk about it as kind of like cachet but yeah. um yeah but this was what like a way of life and you ate according to the seasons and that that fed your intuit intuition how you were going to cook that day right according so, to what's available and yeah time. yeah um so we have a question here i'm curious how intuition is learned mm -hmm. uh perhaps it is willingness to fall so what yeah to fail. yeah absolutely to fail. Sorry. yeah that's a great point i mean it is more learned for some people and it's it's really just about getting in there and trying i mean i'm just thinking about something i made yeah i made something the other day i completely bonded but <laughs> I learned a lot. I yeah. learned a lot, like what I was going to do the next time. Absolutely failing is part of it. Um, and I think it's a little bit like if you, you know, you learn a new language when you're young, uh, you feel, you know, you're not scared of making mistakes. But if you just, you know, you learn that language when you're much older, it's harder because you, you know, you don't yeah. want to be caught making mistakes. So, um, yeah, the, the earlier you start, the better, I think. <laughs> I think so. That's why I have my daughter stripping kale and <laughs> cracking eggs. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I know you do a lot. You, you, you do so many things on consulting clients and cooking for people and teaching. Uh, what is your favorite aspect of uh, your job as you see it? Mm, that's tough. I mean, it really does all feed the other. I mean, I, I do one-on-one -on -one nutritional counseling and within that, you know, we often get into conversations where I'm like talking about a possible recipe that they could make, and then I'm getting an idea for how to then recipe test something else. So, you know, and, and helping somebody heal through their diet is so informative of how I'm going to maybe create a recipe or menu. Um, I mean, teaching is my love. It's my, I, I love being in a classroom with a group of students and the chaos. I just, I don't know if it's the dancer in me and having to be aware of so many things at one time, but I love the chaos. And um, and it's just, and I think people just get such a kick out of cooking. We don't get to really do it much, cook together. Right. And that's why, you know, I I was so bummed with it with, in this pandemic, like not doing my live classes. So I started some virtual cooking classes and we're having a ball and yeah. some people don't even cook. They just want to be in community. They just want to see other people. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. The cooking is my favorite. I mean, the teaching is my favorite part. Yeah. Um, but I do, I do love all the aspects and, and just, I'm feel so fortunate to be a chef and nutritionist and get to work with food at all angles. Right you know, to kind of put on the culinary hat and then put on the sciencey hat. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
it's a lot of fun. Uh, well, I have to say that Marty's food is amazing. Oh. Uh, as you, right back at you. <laughs> she's had some classes here, and I always, you know, she gives me the leftovers, and I lick my fingers. Um, I, I'm thinking about one specific dish that you made. I think it was, um, was it the tofu with cashew and some date syrup or something? Oh yeah, the stir fry. Yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, it was so good. So, and I feel that somebody, you know, people think of like, oh, what kind of food is she? It sounds like. Sometimes it's like weird for people. It's like, oh, she, you know, if you're not doing gluten, then you can't do dairy. But right. it, it's so abundant, whatever, um, you know, you, I always love the food that you make. Thank you, Rena. <laughs> so creative. <laughs> um, and let's see, we have another question. This morning we talked about the confusing advice and how to decide what to listen to. So, um, hmm. The teachers got to, um, uh, we gave them a few, we gave them the movie uh, Game Changers to watch. Have you watched it on Netflix? No. Uh, no, I'm not. About, um, um, you know, a, a vegan, is it vegan? Yeah, it's a vegan diet for um, any extreme sports. Um, so, and about, okay. that was, you know, completely vegan. And then we talked about other diets that, you know, say that, that like a keto diet that has a lot of meat and a lot of protein. And you hear so many things from so many different directions and it's hard to tell what's going to be good for you. Um, do you have an opinion um, about what, you know, who to listen to or what, you know, how, who to follow? If Absolutely. Absolutely. I have very strong opinions about this whole topic. Yeah. You have to listen to your body, first of all. I mean, I was talking about having gone through every diet under the sun. And part of that journey was I was listening to other, you know, messengers outside of myself until I had to get to a place where I was like, okay, um, paleo might be in yeah. a high, a high protein, high fat diet might be in on the internet, but is it right for me? Um, you know, you really have to be wary about about where you're getting this information from. I mean, now it's keto, keto, keto. Keto was keto was first discovered as a therapeutic diet. I mean, this was done for epileptic patients, very specific cancer patients, not all cancers. And now it seems like and now it seems like everybody wants to do keto, that we should all be on a ketogenic diet. Absolutely not. So this is not just like, you're gonna find it one day, what's right for you. You have to really discover, I mean, talk about intuition. This is where intuition comes to play. And we don't always wanna listen to our intuition. We wanna hear what from somebody else, what we should be doing. Um, and I and I, I can tell you, I can tell you from the healthcare point of view, in in different medical circles, I sometimes see one size fits all diets being being prescribed. And we all need something different. We need something different in the seasons, in different seasons when our body needs to warm up or cool down. So it is so individualized. And that's, that is so much of what I work with, with each person is tuning into that. Yeah. Listening to your body. Listening, yeah. listening, you know, sometimes you wake up, you want a bowl of oatmeal. Sometimes you wake up and you want a green smoothie. I don't know. It's like, yeah, yeah, it changes. It changes. So I am not, I, I mean, I'm the wrong person to talk to if you want no, like an extreme, exactly an extreme opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. And lastly, um, is there any recipe that people that you make that people love or love to learn how to make? Um, if you want to tell us about a beloved dish or something beloved. that you like eating. Oh my gosh. It really, it's so, it depends on the scenario. I mean, yeah. right now. So yeah, let's um, do it right now. Yeah. I don't, I won't hold you to it. For, yeah. Right now people yeah. love you know, it's it's just really uh, hot weather. People love making uh, my mint green smooth. I'll, I'll tell you some that are on my recipe so people can okay. can try them. Um, you know, my mint green smoothie right now. Um, 
I, I, people really love the golden milk tea on my recipe for a lot of different reasons. It's great for insomnia. It's great for calming down. A lot of people are dealing with anxiety right now. Yeah. Um, it's what a turmeric. I have in it. Sounds, uh, interesting. it's two, it's turmeric, black pepper, I think a little cardamom, cinnamon. You know, it's almost chai. Yeah flavor and you could even add black tea if you wanted to but not for nighttime obviously yeah. um and then i think it's you could add either coconut milk or almond some kind of milk base to carry you want something with turmeric you want like a fat okay. to make it more absorbable okay yeah um is it served cold or hot uh i like to right now i would probably drink like an ice golden I, milk yeah, yeah. Wow, that sounds amazing yeah, yeah now i want that thanks yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um yeah i'm not sure if my herbs i i don't know i i oh my gosh it just what are we doing tonight we're grilling pizzas tonight <laughs> um you know when i'm kind of sick or you know not feeling too well i want like a a, a doll like a lentil doll yeah um yeah 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 all sound delicious <laughs> so many we could talk recipes yeah. all day. <laughs> <laughs> okay we have to move on though i want to thank you again marty this has been fun um i used to see marty at least once a week but i know we don't so it's nice to see you like this very good to see you um, and yeah, I'd love to uh, join one of your classes um, to learn some new recipes. Thanks, Renan. I hope you can. Thank you so much. Stay safe, everyone. Okay, okay. back in. Yeah. Um, that was great. I um, I really appreciated the idea of intuition as we're thinking about not just the way that we cook, but also the way that we um, make decisions about what we eat. And I think that's so, that's just, I, that was really um, a great note to think about, to, re to remind ourselves that our own intuition about the way we feel and sort of, be that's where I think even today's writing prompt is so perfect about really like feel it, like sensing the, uh, you know, using our senses to explore the food that we're eating. Um, and even the prompt yesterday <clears throat> to maybe even go back to that prompt and think about, the food that you're eating and how it makes you feel and not just the way it makes you feel again like you know i had a lot of energy after or you know i felt really full or i felt tired but also i really enjoyed it it tasted good it made me you know it was cold and i was hot and all these all these different um ways that we experience it being an important part about of of um of of starting to train our intuition to, right. to, to our, like, make sure we feel what we feel and we relate it to our environment, our situation, and our food. Yeah. yeah. Um, we really use all our senses. Really. Yeah, absolutely. I really like that. Um, okay, so I'm gonna pop back out again. I'm right backstage should you need me at all. Okay. Um, so Arel is, is waiting patiently and apparently making faces at us behind the stage, which I noticed. Uh, so I'm gonna say goodbye and let you guys. Okay. Yeah. This is a reminder to everybody um, watching to, um, to please share uh, questions as we're going through and I can, I'll be backstage. I'm happy to post the questions or pop back on and ask them. And Will um, is saying that we'd like the recipe for the tea. So I believe, uh, let me do one more time. I'm gonna post um, Marty's website. Her, her recipes that she mentioned are on her website. Um, so check yeah. martywilson.com and um, if it's not there, we'll, we'll find it for you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let me say goodbye to you guys. Okay. <laughs> Hello, I can probably hear you because uh, he's upstairs and I'm down here. Uh, hi, Aral, nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you finally. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we have um, some um, teachers listening to us right now. Some of them are going to see it um, a little bit later. Uh, this is going to be on a YouTube channel, just so you know. Um, Arel is, uh, he didn't put his last name, but it's Arel Cheville. He's my husband. Uh, he's a clinical psychologist uh, treating patients um, via Zoom in the past uh, four months. Uh, and uh, it's funny to make an introduction. <laughs> you know, should I say when we met? No, that's not a different story. Um, 
So Arel is, uh, I think he graduated, when was it, 2011? So I think nine years ago. Uh, Marcy saying hi. Uh, and then um, he did his postdoc um, at Columbia University dealing with uh, PTSD patients, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And sure. today he treats an array of you know symptoms and conditions. I'd like to say probably mostly anxiety and trauma. Am I right? Okay. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> this is funnier than I thought it would be. <laughs> so, um, so I'm gonna just start with my first question. Um, when and how did you start uh, researching the issue of food and mental health? How did that come about? Um, when I met you. <laughs> okay. Stop. Wait. Just a second. Okay. This is um oh he's getting his coffee. Okay. 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 <laughs> I'm sorry. Um is that good? Um okay, so you know as a psychologist, um you know my aim is to um is to sort of predict you know predict how people will react in sort of environment and also to see where they are when they come to me. And it's really hard, for me, it was very hard to dissect what's influenced more, people past, people current relationship, you name it. Now, I, um, I was, I'm a clinical psychologist, so I'm not a psychiatrist. So I'm, I'm, I don't have a medical, I'm not an MD, I'm a PhD, so I don't give medication. And for many years as I was practicing, I, I, I I was having a hard time with um with um, um how uh, psychiatric medication influenced my patient. So I'm not against that at all. I'm for that, and it could be very helpful in many ways. But I saw it as an aim for myself to many help people get off medication and use the tool that I give them. And then I was at some point I was stumbling on a book. It's called um, uh, I contain I I contain uh, multiple multiple multiples. I contain, help me. <laughs> I'm gonna look it up, yeah. And, um, and, it, and and the book is not about psychology, it actually talks about uh, uh, close friends of ours in our body, microbiome, uh, the microbiome environment, which contain the microbiome in our bodies and um, bacteria and, 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 and as such. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, it's called I Contain Multitude. Or multitudes. Sorry. Go ahead. Thank you, my love. And sure. then, uh, and, um, and 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 you know, the book actually tells the story how we are. We you know everybody, and I'm sure that a lot of you know that. And it's it's like how those you know microbes in our in our you know most you know all around our body, mostly in our gut. Uh, influence our behavior, our feeling, everything we do. And it's fascinating me. So I got really to read about it. And one thing, just an anecdote uh, that struck me as very, very important uh, in, in this connection was, for example, one of the most prescribed uh, medication today in psychiatry is um, something, you know, an active component called SSRIs, which works specifically on a neurotransmitter called serotonin. Uh, which been given to people with anxiety and depression as well. It's one of the you know Prozac and Lexapro, which is once the most prescribed medication that actually in the field, of, not just in in medicine. And it's you know it's been known that there is specific you know if you will um, bacteria bacteria in our guts that if you give them the right food they actually break it down. And produce the serotonin, and 25% of our uh, body produces it in the, the guts, and uh, which fascinated me, which actually led me to think that you know theoretically, that if I can you know help my patient uh, you know eat different food that is healthier, or have or, or actually refer them to a nutritionist, or because I'm not in in no way uh, equipped to know, I'm a psychologist that they can change their mood significantly and not have to be on a medication or 
because their body is going to produce that for them instead of an exactly. exactly. And that's led me for an, uh, to all sort of uh, interesting stuff. For example, uh, you know, increasing the infl inflammation with different parts of the body, uh, heavily related to what we eat and stuff like that, is in fact creating uh, anxiety uh, in people that they go to therapists like me, trying to find the right tools to cope with anxiety, not knowing that, you know, the, for the basic of it, maybe they need to change, you know, those inflammation factors. So I help a lot of my patients ask the right question because I was doing different work with them. I'm, again, I'm not a nutritionist, but um, to ask the right question, their doctors and do the right, uh, you know, have the right um, uh, checkup for them to see if they have, for example, what we call a leaky gut, which is where the lining of the gut is leaking and, you know, and there is um, different uh, microbes sort of, get, you know, getting into the bloodstream is actually creating, it's very dangerous and creating more inflammation and more anxiety and stuff like that. Um, the reading goes on and, you know, you see how those, um, you, you mentioned with Marty, the magic pill and stuff like that. So we see how, for me at least, in my field, how this affects people be, you know, directly affect people's behavior we're talking about here, right? So it's, and behavior for me, it's symptoms. And it's important to say that because I worked in, in a world that I'm trying to help people with their symptoms first and foremost. Symptom would be, for example, people who comes to me with anxiety, as you said. Yeah. People who comes to me with depression, people who come to me with the real life issue that what I try to do as soon as possible to reduce it to minimum and there I go deep side what the root of it. But in order to deep with this anxiety, I need to go to, you know, sleeping habit, food, and of course my own, you know, say cognitive behavioral method to have them to stop it. And then we go deep into the psychology of it. So when, when you have a new patient, do you actually ask them about the, the, what they eat? Um, yeah. Yeah, in a very broad way, mm -hmm. uh, I ask them what they, you know, what their diet habit, what they eat before they go to bed, uh, what they wake up, and what's their diet composed. Just as something to talk about. I also talk about. Uh, I also dive into intake. Intake is what we I do the first few uh, visits. We take a lot of. Uh, I take a lot of history of the patient. It's called an intake, and and what I do there, I ask a lot of uh, you know about past. Uh, you know, about their past relation to history in relation to food. Okay. It's very important. So, so yeah, it leads me to our next question. Uh, is the aspects of food or eating uh, reflect the well-being of a patient? Um, so if you can elaborate on that a little bit. Um, well, so, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Should I repeat that? You can oh elaborate. No, I know we, we went over that before, but yeah. yeah. Um, not to make it harder. Um, I think I think for me it's very important. So up until now, I talked specifically about the food they are eating. Actually, right. so, you know uh, what they call probiotic, or prebiotic, and stuff like that. How we sort of feed our guts with our friends and microbes in order to affect the symptoms that we have vis-a-vis. Um, sleeping habits and, um, you know, sleeping pattern and even in anxiety and depression, as you said, the symptom itself. But um, so that would be the, you know, what okay. my, the, the value might, what they're putting in their mouth, the substance itself. But for me, when it comes, when I'm writing the picture, I like to see people, in, how people uh, behave with the food as a manifestation for their mental being. So for example, uh, you know, you know how they find comfort in food, or for example, their past behavior in food is a reflection to their mental state right now, uh, which obviously can go to a lot of places. So, for example, you know, and it doesn't have to be reflected by the way uh, visually. In other words, I mean, I don't need to find, and we'll get to it later when I'm going to give you an example, of course, about specific patient that I was treating, but um, which will give you a little bit, a uh, little bit the feeling of how I work and you know, what, how I actually use this frame of uh, mind or, um, th you know, theoretical um, uh, standpoint. But really, the, um, I, you know, I, I see food as a focal important things to understand people's history. Yeah. 
Uh, we're talking, uh, we're talking uh, also about rituals. Um, so if we can, you know, we can even use that word as, you know, food ritual, how, um, what, and what does that mean if a person eats one way or another? Absolutely. And how one way. So, uh, it, it, so, and the ritual is, we can actually use another word if you don't mind, habits. Yeah. And habits is something that established with time and triggers, right? So if if I know I can I can learn a lot about people, even relationship with their parents, without even hearing a word about their parents, because I see how they use it to sort of preoccupy themselves, to distract themselves, mm -hmm. specific comfort, uh, um, distract over stress, you name it. So the ritual becomes so important. Um, um, you know we. Because, because if you think about it, I mean, um, if I think about it at least, you know, out of if we, in my opinion, it's like um, there was two things up. Other than the meal that we eat around the table, which which is a little bit social, also, you know, right. with family and stuff like that, yeah. maybe lunch and dinner, breakfast, lunch and dinner. In between them, the snack that we eat, the thing that we put in our mouth, open the window, open them. The window, open up the window. I open the, <laughs> um, the refrigerator or whatever and eat. We don't really think about it. Usually we do it, uh, usually if you if you think about it, you're actually doing it out of boredness. You are bored, so you do that. So that would be an example. What is boredness? You want to have some feeling. You don't like, you know, you know what you're doing or you have a low or you have, a, you know, need a spike of sugar, so you go in it. So for me, I'm actually investigating that and I can see how this uh, you know in a more in a normal sense not in a pathology yeah in the pathology sense which we'll talk about it that working with people with actually eating disorder this is where that the food really getting into the you know the pathological state of the people and how they deal with food and uh how they deal with their own uh, self-image and and how to work with that again with this specific pathology which again i'm sort of going to the next question already uh, because I don't know how much time we have, but uh, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, um, again, my theory of how do I sort of improve people's pathology with food uh, by improving their relationship with food, not just behaviorally. Do you want to jump into the, 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 we don't have time, right? No, no, we, yeah, yeah, you, we have a little bit of time. Yeah, we have time. Um, I don't know. Did yeah. I answer your question? I'm not sure. So, no, no. I was asking how you know how what aspects of food or eating uh, reflect a, a well-being of a patient. So, um, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, we'll see. Well, I'll, I'm gonna say it's the next question about uh, about if you want to, if you can tell us, um, um, you know, give us an example of a patient, um, so we we can hear you know a specific example. And then if we'll have a little bit more time, then we'll we'll go back to the aspects of food um, and hear more about habits, because I think that's an important issue too. Um, so yeah, you can tell us if you can give us an example of a, a patient or treatment, and then we'll we'll see if we have more time. Okay. Um, okay. So I had um okay. What is it? Sorry. Should I talk? You can yeah, hear me? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Um, I had a, a patient uh, which she had a lot of, um, she, she had a severe case of eating disorder. Uh, she was anorexic. She was in her late 20s and she'd been treated all her life. And, um, and, and but that was not her only, I mean, it, eating disorder never comes only with, you know, comes with a bundle of problem. Well, you know, with had you know, she had a lot of anxiety and what we call a lot of attachment problems uh, and stuff like that. And she'd been treated again, as I was saying, in, in her life, inpatient, outpatient. And the method was how the method was always about how she could gain more weight. This is that that was really the the framework of uh, how to treat it. Um, so I, I, I wanted to sort of change the, the way, not, not necessarily the, um, my, my job, my, I saw my job with her, not necessarily to change, you know, not to teach her about food and what she need to eat and the significance and the fact that she's really, you know, uh, ruined her, you know, her body completely. 
what are the relationship that you have with, with the food? And one of the things that I wanted to see is to sort of have in a, in, in a way to change not just the habit, you know, to change the habit by, um, uh, by changing the behavior around food. Mm -hmm. So the way we, my, with the way I see it, with the way we set it up is that we met three times a week. We met early in the morning sometime uh, or doing lunch. And each time we met, we ate together. So we ate lunch together in my room, which is very unorthodox. Uh, uh, it's something that a lot of um, people would disagree upon, uh, but I um, I found it very useful. And the re the reason I did that not only to make not not to make sure that she would eat, but to change the relationship to her with her food. I know from her background that food was very restricted in her house. It was always it's always people looked what she ate, how she ate it. It was very she was always have to be very appropriate how she ate. It have to be very clean. So it comes with a lot of what we call um, OCD symptoms. And the, so I didn't really care how she ate in how much she ate. What we did, we sort of um, split the food into half. And I, and I try intentionally to eat a little bit messy, which is not hard for me because I'm a messy eater anyway. Uh, but uh, you, also made it, you, you made it about eating socially, which is also another interesting aspect of food. It wasn't just about putting the food in your body, but it was about sitting together and having a shared experience. Exactly, that experience. Yeah. And then and, and eating with your finger, and uh, and uh, we did that, and 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 it and it become fun for her, and it would sort of associate her with with um, you know, food becomes something uh, regardless of the taste or what she puts in, it's become some 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 something of enjoyable thing that we can establish as a. You know, routine afterward. So the association that come with the food is something fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, and did you see? Uh, did you see a change in uh, in her symptoms uh, because of uh, this kind of treatment? Uh, um, first of all, yes. I mean, it's um, it was qu quite moving, actually. I mean, she didn't have uh, her period. What happened with um, with people with anorexia? They get to a point where they lose their period after a while, and, um, and for a while, and because they get to a low BMI, and um, and I think about um, three months after we worked together, she got her period after um, um, I want to say six months or so afterward. Yeah, which is obviously not because of this uh, lean uh, lunch that we did together. So yeah. she took it afterward, and um, um, did has she after three years was uh, having difficult problem uh, eating problem? Of course she did, but she, um, but I I think she, I, I think I didn't able to change her habit. But I definitely tried to change her, I'll call it the attachment, which she has toward food. Yeah. Which attachment is a big word in psychology. Yeah. yeah. Um, we had a question here before about, um, I think if I read it correctly before it went away. Yeah. Is it difficult to get your patients to be honest about their uh, eating habits? Uh, or do you think that maybe some of them are trying to hide it or they're ashamed of it or something? Yeah, that's... That's an excellent question because the question probably um, comes from you know patient with with as I cope with a pathology with people with eating disorder. I think it would be, I think patient with eating disorder usually wouldn't be honest about it. It's a little bit like working with people with addiction. Uh, unfortunately, they're they're ashamed of it. They encounter a lot of shame in the way they eat, and then they're not really going to be honest with you. I think. People who are not in the pathologies and people, as we spoke about at the beginning, who are, were assessing yeah, actually. People have anxiety or depression. Do they, are they happy to expose? Um, what they, what they, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, when, and again, when we talk about habit, I want to know not specifically how much calorie they eat. I'm not a, I want to, I want to know, you know, um, I, I want to learn the, again, the, the, overarching theme about their life their life so to see what their relationship with team so it's not how much you eat to do in a, in, you know but to see how organized they are 
our habit if they have the same breakfast every day. Okay. Um, do we? Do you want to maybe touch uh, a little bit about uh, different food habits and what they mean? Um, you know, if somebody does some kind of a ritual before they eat, or um, if they, uh, you know, if they do have like to have exactly the same meal in the morning or in the afternoon or the same snack. Uh, do, can you kind of maybe map it out for us what it what it means to be a certain way, just out of curiosity? <laughs> uh, okay. Um, Sorry, I'm, um, I'm jumping back in again because you guys are cracking me up. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying not to laugh. It's hard to not jump in and, and comment on it, and I, and I just had to. Um, <laughs> but I, I am sort of curious about that question too, about you know what are what the habits or the rituals that we have say about the way that we are experience our relationship with food. If there are certain things that you pick up on in a conversation that makes you, you know, think about the way that 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 relationship or that habit or that ritual is going to potentially impact mood or behavior. I like to see, you know, when I uh, talk to people, if uh, how much, like anything else that I do, uh, to see what level of awareness it's sort of food uh, take place in people like. In other words, you know, when it comes to food, how much is external versus internal uh, motivating them? So, um, you know, it's, if, it's, if it's come from obsessive quality, from a place of only losing weight, or if it comes from a place of um, say hypochondria that people really fear of getting sick, or that, you know, if people are, as Marty was speaking about before, which was so nice about uh, people being attuned, to just they feel like they want to eat a pizza right now or stuff like that. So to see how restrictive there is. And I feel that to your question about habits, in my approach, I feel that strong habits, uh, actually rigid habits, allow, uh, you know, allowed um, a lot of um, freedom of what, we're gonna, what we eat. So, so I recommend my patients to, uh, um, uh, not from, again, I don't, I, I don't try to sort of take a place of nutrition. I mean, I'm by no mean an expert, but I think it's very important for a patient to know what he eats every morning when he wakes up, uh, only because it's sort of lowering down the anxiety of the decision making in the morning, mm. and allowing people to be more, uh, um, you know, allowing people to be more um, attuned to their surrounding, not, you know, not open the, you know, the refrigerator again, and uh, to just make up what to eat and stuff like that. Or on the other hand, you know, realize that they didn't eat and it's 11.30 in the morning. So I, my, my theory around food is totally consistent and co cohesive with my theory about my treatment anyway. It's all about, it's all about, at the end of the day, awareness. And uh, awareness to um, our needs, physical need, but awareness to our emotional need and Etc. And 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 I feel that I didn't really answer your question. When I'm asking people about their food, I wanted to see when you know I wanted to see how food served them mentally. So I want to see them, for example, when 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 exactly you feel that you need a snack. When do you find yourself? And even if someone would be it'd be hard for them to actually answer me that, for me it would be also a level of awareness in a way because it couldn't be that I'm not snacking and stuff like that. I must say that I hardly, you know, for me it doesn't. It, 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 as long as it's not in the extreme, if someone comes that, that you know for a fact that, that this person is probably has a you know very food restricted diet because she or he is really 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 a skinny or the other way around, um, I, I I have no judgment and I think my my, my patient says being open about it. Yeah, I feel like that's a perfect, it's such a perfect segue from what we talked about this morning and really? what, we're, what we're going into. Yeah, I, I feel like you guys maybe had a conversation before or something. But just the <laughs> no, I'm actually talking. I mean, from what time is that? I don't know. We haven't talked about it. No. 
<laughs> I think the um, the idea that by putting in more, I don't know if rigid is the right word, but more routine, like being stricter about routine creates a freedom to that, eat. Oh. It's so interesting to me. I uh, love that. Uh, I, wow, I'm actually, uh, Jenna, I'm kind of surprised that, because usually when I say it, people think that I'm um, contradicting myself, but I don't think so. Yeah. No, honestly. like it's brilliant. I, I totally no, because, because if you think about it, we, all, we always open the refrigerator and we think, what should we eat? And when you see that, you look inside and say, but what do you really want to eat right now? And then in front of you, it, for me, it's like, um, it's like, it's like I'm saying that uh, editors of HBO dictated what I'm going to watch. And the uh, editor of, uh, of for, you know, any, you know, I don't know, New York Times, what I'm reading and what I'm interested in, and I hate it. So it's the same when you, we, we open the refrigerator, you're like, you don't know what you eat, and you look in the refrigerator, and then something pops up, and that's what you choose to eat. But you didn't really choose it. Yeah, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know what I want. <laughs> so I must say, the only thing I'm not deciding in my life, the only thing I decide in my life, is my breakfast. It's true. I, I, this is my autonomy in food. <laughs> but if you, but if you, you know, I think if I, 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 I really do think that food is no different than you know. I speak to a lot of patients and a lot of people, and people talk to me about waking up, having exercise, uh, for example, or um, or uh, meditating and stuff like that. And I don't hear people really talk to me about the regimen of of what they eat. And usually it comes from a place of only from health. So I'm doing my smoothie. And then by uh, 11 o'clock, they shove you know, a few cookies there and, um, and, and can I wait for lunch? Yeah. Uh, and I think, I think food needs to be as regiment as within our, uh, you know, as restricted, you know, you know, we need to know what we eat. And, it, and, 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 and we actually, it doesn't have to be, um, uh, in my opinion, it shouldn't be very, it should be even dull. It shouldn't be very interesting. I'm serious. Uh, because it's, uh, it's no, because then we always, you know, because then we're using what we call the dopamine system and we need to sort of surprise ourselves. That is never enough. So it needs to be a little bit even boring at some point. And, and then when you do it enough time, it's become, actually looking forward for that and it's becoming more interesting. Yeah, well, that's where like the ritual comes in. We started um, at the beginning of the whole like quarantine, we started Friday night pizza nights. And knowing that I don't have to make, like I don't have to think about what I'm making on Friday nights, it's like the most joyful night. And it's, you know, 16 weeks in, and it, we counted, we have done it 16 weeks in a row. And uh, it's it's better every time because they <laughs> Coming. It's joyful. The pizza is a little different each time. Like it always tastes a little different, but there's something in the consistency that makes it. Um, and for the and for the kids, yeah. right? They're not, yeah, not for they're sure. part of the reality. It's not like okay. Yeah, so, and they yeah. ask like, "What are we having?" I was like, "It's Friday," and they're like, "Oh, right, pizza night, pizza night." Okay. <laughs> it goes the other way around. When it comes to food, we shouldn't surprise. Yeah. In the routine. Now, if you're doing like an, a, a nice. Um, Dinner in the evening, do do surprise. Do yeah. Surprise. But <laughs> I don't watch. There's some cash there, but uh, uh, yeah, but, it, it, but but so here we are. I mean, no, but it's very important because we're separating food here between the social event, the people gathering around the table, than the day to day what we feed our body. Uh, and by the way, going back to what I spoke in the beginning. And again, and connected to Marty and stuff like that. Once you know what your diet needs to be consistent of, and you sort of routine about that. I mean, again, I'm you're the expert, but it's sort of um, it stabilizes you. It's grounding you, grounding in terms of in a way of like you know, um, you feel more in control of your life. It really reducing one anxiety and uh, it's taking off another stuff and people. Because you know people always struggle about it, and, and, um, and so it's sort of you know it's it, ironically, and I'm, I appreciate that you got it that you got what I was saying because I'm not always clear. Um, in terms of it's like you know it's trying 
it, the habit comes as a synonym of getting too much control restricted in our life, but it's actually redeeming us and giving us more freedom uh, to sort of grab into this control of what we're eating all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you later. <laughs> Bye, Ral. Hopefully we can see you in person one day soon. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay. Okay, but uh, too uh, funny. <laughs> I was trying not to laugh because we, we have a lot of. Of course, not, 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 yeah. I love it. I love it. <laughs> um, yeah, so, that, those were uh, interesting talks, and they worked really well together. Um, I totally agree. I actually think that it was such a nice way to sort of lead into the nutritional aspect of it, and then. Um, and then move into the idea of like, take the nutrition away and talk just about the function and the role of sort of the tradition and the ritual that is so perfect yeah. as we go into our readings for the next couple of days. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, um, we're moving into the cooking part and yeah. I know we talked about doing sort of like a meditation or music. I don't know, I, I, I realized that I didn't set that up, but um, if people need to take a little break, um, maybe if you can just send a comment, if you want to take a little moment, um, Renan and I can kind of get set up and we can keep chatting and have, um, you know, conversation over the comments. And then maybe what I'll say is it's 4.02 now. Uh, maybe we'll start cooking at like 4.10. Okay. Yeah, great. Well, well, to, to give everybody a chance to, if they're going to, if they're going to cook with us to get their supplies together. Um, I'm going to move my computer. It's plugged in here and I have my setup for cooking um, behind me. And so hopefully it will have enough charge. But if not, I'll, I'll just move the computer around. Okay. But for those of you who are still watching, please share any thoughts or comments or feedback um, on our speakers this afternoon. And in terms of the cooking piece, um, what we're going to be making is a salad. And so we're really just asking, you know, you can kind of follow along. And this is less of a cooking lesson, although it certainly can act as one. I think many of us have made salads. It's more about a chance to kind of, again, mindfully prepare something that we may have done very often and to talk about the ingredients and what kinds of um, things we get through. So as we're making our salads together, and I'm gonna make one here, Renana's gonna make one. I hope some of you will join and make one. Um, we will talk through that and um, kind of cook together from afar. It's one of my favorite parts of the class is when we're cooking together. Um, and of course, not able to do that um, this year in the same room, but hopefully we can on these Tuesdays and Thursdays cook together um, in our respective homes. And so the idea is a um, is a uh, sort of like a choose your own adventure salad. And I think the other thing I was thinking about um, this afternoon as I was thinking about preparation for today was the idea of um, like choose your own adventure learning as well and, and starting to think about this idea of like categorizing um, ingredients or um, concepts and then using those cate cate uh, categories to like to make sure there's lots of options within that, especially as we're moving to these sort of like unusual ways of learning. And so um, please chime in as we're cooking and um, as we're prepping and as we're, you know, as you're cooking at home with, with comments. Um, and if the comments are not working for you for any reason, you can um, send an email to my email or to Ramana's email or to our um, uh, text messages. We have our phones with us as well. All right, so I'm going to move my computer, and I see Renana setting up. I've got my setup here. I'm going to make sure the lighting is working. We just started um, cooking at the farmhouse for our virtual lessons also, and still kind of figuring out the best camera angle. Oh, and Marcy says that you can send any questions to her as well. So should, she's checking in also. I'll, um, raise my camera just a little bit.
Okay. Renata, your yeah. kitchen always looks so nice. What is it? Your kitchen always looks so nice. Oh. Just because it's all white and it, and my kids don't come in here to cook, so it's <laughs> that way. We'll just wait a couple more minutes to get started. Um, and I think we're, uh, I'm actually going to start with a uh, dressing. Okay, um, I'll do the same. And then I'm going to go through the, have a couple of different ideas for salads. Um, have you, do you know this, um, this product? I mean, this one you wouldn't know, Stonington Kelp Company, but Furikake. It's um, no. F-U-R-I-K-A-K-E. No, I don't think I've ever heard of it. What is it? I picked it up from the farm stand. It's um, it's kelp, and it's uh, vegan furikake or furikake. It's dried sugar kelp, sesame seeds, sugar cane, salt, and salt, and it's a spice. But I've never um, used it before. But I thought I would put it on my salad today because it has oh. some sesame seeds in it. Um, delicious. Is it savory? So it's yeah. Well, the kelp makes it kind of salty. Yeah. Uh, so it has like, um, let's see if you can. Yeah. It has kelp flakes in it. Okay. Um, and it's delicious. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. It's sort of like this umami flavor and then we yeah. have sesame seeds. It must be like toasted sesame seeds and some salt. Huh. Yeah. Oh, and Will is asking about the ingredients for Thursday. Which we're not gonna. Um, I have to, yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna post them on tonight. You'll post them tonight. Okay. Yeah. And we're doing. Um, um, in terms, if we want to, while we're waiting for a few more minutes, I think we can talk quickly. We're gonna be doing a quick pickle. So that's really any hard vegetable, and a vinegar, salt, sugar, and then we can go kind of go crazy from there. But those would be the basics. So salt, sugar, vinegar, and a hard vegetable. Yeah. And then for the fruit compote. It's like really any fruit. If you have something that's in season, that's great. So like, um, you know, strawberries or raspberries are just coming in. Right. Um, but you certainly could use frozen fruit, you know, just oh, for the yeah. as well. And that would just be like fruit and sugar. Um, I think I'm going to use rhubarb for oh. mine. And then um, for the sh uh, shakshuka. Yeah, for the shakshuka, it's... Um it's a bunch of ingredients, but it's uh, it's any kind of onion, um, any greens. Um, I usually use uh, some spinach and Swiss chard, but you can use kale or really any anything. Um, and then eggs. Um, trying to think what else. I think it has a little bit of vegetable stock in it, and then you top it with some feta cheese. Um, and if you have za'atar, it's um, it's kind of it's close to oregano. So if you can't find za'atar, which is kind of hard to come by, um, you can you can just use some dried uh, oregano. Perfect. Yeah. Well, I'll put, I'm going to put that up for from Marcy. I'm going to grab my measuring spoons just while I'm. <laughs> okay. Um, so <clears throat> we're going to start with two different kinds of dressings. Um, um, and we're trying to keep in mind um, uh, keeping our gut healthy. Yeah. Uh, so, we're going to do, uh, so yeah, I'm going to make a yogurt-based 
um, dressing and Jen is going to make, um, it, it's a soy. Yeah, it's a soy um, maple syrup rice vinegar. And so the vinegar, the, the you know, the fermented um, vinegar um, has some properties that support gut health. Um, the soy sauce is also fermented soy, obviously soybeans. Um, and, um, and then the maple syrup, you could use honey as well. But if you're following a strict vegan um, diet, I switch to the to maple syrup for this one. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're gonna start with the dressings and then we're gonna move on to the salads. Um, uh, I'm just gonna tell you one more thing I did in advance. Uh, I decided to put some kind of grains in the salad. I didn't want to, for it to be, uh, you know, I just did it right now. So I didn't want it to really cook it beforehand. So I, I got some bulgur, which is uh, soaked in cracked wheat. And I am just soaking it in some water. Um, it is also used in, um, no, I forgot the name of the salad, uh, tabbouleh salad. Mm -hmm. I soak up some bulgur. So I thought that would give us a nice um, crunch uh, and fill us up a little bit. Uh, so that's what, the only thing that I did in advance. I just, yeah, like two minutes ago, I, I put some bulgur in the water and I'm just letting it stand. Uh, it was just cold water from the faucet, nothing. Uh, that I heated up right. in advance. And it's a good chance to use, um, uh, you know, like any leftover brown rice or, or, um, or you know, or whatever, you know, if you have any grains left over. Right. Um, I sometimes use just some leftover pasta as well if you have that lying around. Um, or yeah, but if it's any like hearty grain, that will add some uh, crunch and flavor to your salad. Um, so for the dressing, uh, I'm gonna make tzatziki, which is also a dip. Uh, I love making it over the summer uh, because it's nice and cool and you can, you know, just have some carrot sticks or pita chips to, uh, to dip into the tzatziki. Um, and it's really easy. Um, I make it a lot with kids. I've made it on farmer's market a lot because it's just, you know, it's, it's a quick, it's a quick dish. Um, and yeah, and af of course you can use it as a salad dressing, of course. So I am going to start with grating some carrots, uh, sorry, some cucumbers. Um, so I'm just going to use this side of the grater and you can use the small cucumbers or big cucumbers and you'll need about a half a cup of grated cucumbers. And this is in this, does it act sort of like a thickener for the dip? Um, it's not really a thickener, I think, because the, the cucumbers have so much water in them. So sometimes it even waters the uh, waters it down. Um, but it just adds a little bit of crunch and it's very refreshing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, as we talk about the sensory elements of um, our dishes, uh -huh. you know, the great the cucumber in there does, you know, it certainly is going to add texture. Yeah. Um, so I did one small cucumber. It's probably about a half a cup. I'm just going to put it in my bowl over here. And then I'm going to measure one cup of yogurt. And I'm using a plain uh, whole milk yogurt. Okay. And it's not, is it a Greek yogurt? No, it's not Greek. Um, especially because you can do it with a Greek yogurt and then it's going to be better for a dip. But because mm -hmm. we're using this uh, as a dressing, I want it to be a little bit more runny. Uh, but you can also use a you know, regular yogurt for the dip. Um, you can also strain it yourself uh, and you just need to put it on, you know, on some cheesecloth and let it drip uh, probably for about a half hour uh, or even with a couple of paper towels if you don't have a cheesecloth. Um, oh, just to get thicker. Yeah, so sure. get rid of some of the, those liquids that sometimes are on the top. That's the way. Uh, but I'm I, I'm just gonna do everything today because I I do want it to be to have a runny consistency um, as a dressing. So I'm just gonna measure about one cup of yogurt. I'm gonna put it right on top of my fingers. And then I am gonna take two garlic cloves. You can use one or two depending on, here I'm gonna move the rest of my veggies, so. Okay, Ooh, my avocado just rolled 
<laughs> off. Um, and you can crush it, you can mince it. Um, I'm actually gonna use the grater. Sometimes I just grate it. So I'm gonna, my cloves are pretty small, so I'm gonna use two. You can use a cheese grater or the small side, the, the side of the grater that has the smaller holes. I'm gonna do one more. And while you're doing that, I can get started on the, um, <clears throat> the dressing here. Okay. Um, so we're gonna use um, rice vinegar, but you can absolutely use uh, white vinegar or cider, apple cider vinegar. Um, um, white wine vinegar would be fine as well. And I think, um, I can't say how big of a salad. So the ratio is like three tablespoons of rice vinegar to about a tablespoon of maple syrup. So this is where the acid and the, um, this one has, this one's a little bit, sorry, I should say it's a lot less sort of oily. It's a little more, um, you know, has more vinegar than a, than a typical vinaigrette, I would say. Um, so I'm going to start with three tablespoons. I may double it later, but we'll do about three tablespoons of vinegar to get started on ours. And I always like to make more dressing that I need and then just have it in the fridge. Um, just yeah. a, a homemade dressing tastes so much better than a bought one. And if you have it in the fridge, I always makes me want to eat more salad because I know I have this great dressing. Yeah, and like what Ural was about like the, the consistency, like if you say like, well, I'm just going to have a salad every day for lunch this week. Right. And you have the dressing already made, you're halfway there. Right, absolutely. Um, so it's three tablespoons of rice vinegar and then I'm going to add a tablespoon of maple syrup. Okay, so you've added... Um, to your uh, two cloves of garlic, mm -hmm. um, the cucumber and the yogurt, the cup of yogurt. And I'm gonna add one tablespoon of olive oil and then I'm gonna squeeze some lemon. I'm gonna have two tablespoons of lemon. Okay. Um, and so I've got my vinegar and my maple syrup. I'm just gonna whisk those together. Um, and I'm gonna then add my uh, soy sauce and my sesame oil. So I'm gonna start with about a quarter, um, I'm gonna go with a half a teaspoon actually of both, a half a teaspoon of sesame and a half a teaspoon of soy sauce. And sesame oil is so, it has such a strong flavor. Yes, yeah, so even if you are gonna go with a more of an olive, like an oil-based vinaigrette, like a traditional vinaigrette that's two parts oil to one part acid, um, I would just do a little bit of the sesame oil and then complement it with either vegetable oil or grapeseed oil or something more neutral. Because yeah. you're right, it is really strong. But we've been using so much sesame seed oil in the last couple months. I'm not sure why, but yeah. it's a big favorite. Where are you using it on? Oh, well, we've been doing it with our... Um, well, I bought, so the, the kelp I'm going to talk about in a little bit, um, we have a kelp farmer here who's amazing. Did she talk with the Scarsdale group? I can't remember if anybody can yeah, remember. Yeah, so so um, Susie um, shared this dressing with us and this recipe with us. So I'm using her recipe for the dressing. So I've been doing it for her kelp, and then now I just do it on cucumber salads. Okay. And we've been using it on our snow peas. Um, mm -hmm. When we saute our snow peas, it's wow. so good. So um, broccoli. Kind of everything. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to add my um, sesame oil as well to this. And you know, I'm giving measurements again: three tablespoons of vinegar, one tablespoon of maple syrup, um, a half a teaspoon of soy, and a half a teaspoon of sesame oil. But you know, if it's not salty enough, you add more. A little more soy sauce if you like it to be a little bit more sesame focused. Add a little bit more sesame. Yeah. And I'm curious um, for those of you who are cooking with us, what um, or if not cooking with us, what are your sort of favorite dressings that you make that you add? Um, I have uh, one of our educators adds um, uh, to his vinaigrette. He always adds uh, jam or jelly. Mm. That was so interesting. I had never done that before, so I'm yeah. curious for that. And for that little bit of sweetness. Um, 
So I just added a little bit. So I added the two tablespoons of lemon juice uh, and a little bit of salt. Um, and traditionally, this is made with dill. Um, I don't have dill, so I went to pick some mint from the garden, which I thought would work nicely. Um, so I'm just going, I have, let's see, about six to eight big leaves of, of uh, mint that I'm just going to mince up and add to the yogurt. So, and I just decided to add a little bit more soy sauce because it was, it was a little bit too sweet. Um, and, and then the recipe does call for some salt to taste. So I, I'll probably add a little bit of salt as well. Mm. It's getting there. Okay. I think I'll do a little more. I think I'm going to go two teaspoons on the um, sesame and two teaspoons on the soy sauce. And I actually have some, um, I have some mint also. It's a different kind of mint and it's a little wilty. I was going to add it to my salad, but I think what I may do is just kind of mince what's left of it and try to get it into my, because it kind of, it kind of wilted in the bag. Well, I'm going to add a little bit to my dressing as well. I think that'll be a good addition. Ah. And I think um, herbs are such a good way to add different greens and, and variety. Right. Um, and, you know, a lot of, I know a lot of the teachers were working with their students um, growing um, gardens this spring, but herbs are such a great thing. Even if you have a small space, right. The amount of, I mean, that, that's changed everything. And, you know, we, I grow, um, I grow thyme and um, oregano and basil and it's so, and dill this year, actually, yeah. I have some dill to bring you. Um, it goes really easily, Renana, actually, if you want to add that. I didn't, have, um, I didn't try this year, but I tried a couple of years ago, and it wasn't very successful. I had a hard time. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it was super easy. I just planted it, direct seeded it. Oh, and okay. I, have, I have had a ton of dill. It's been really nice. So it's um, it's a pretty easy thing to grow. And, it, you know, herbs can be expensive at the grocery yeah. store. And, you know, you think like, oh, I don't want to buy a whole pack of herbs. Oh and it's nice. That's exactly. You just go pick a few leaves. And yeah, exactly. Talk about like pizza night. It's added like yeah. such a nice touch to our pizza nights. Yeah. Um, I also kind of just remember that one of, uh, um, it always, it's always so much fun. We Sometimes we make salads and uh, cooking class with kids. And then I let them make their own dressing. And I just tell them kind of a formula of what they need to follow. Um, and I tell them, open the pantry, go to the garden, get whatever you want. And it's just a fun way to explore and start, you know, and then they taste it and they see that they need a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Um, and it's not such a big dish that they say, oh, I completely ruined it. It's something, it's a, such a nice thing to say uh, if you want to start. Yeah, um, we, we, we intuition. And, Experimenting in the kitchen, dressing is really a good way to do that. It's true, and we did. We did. Um, I have to tell you this funny story. We did. Um, uh, we did a visit in the fall, I guess, and we had a school group, a middle school group here, doing um, their uh, trip, and we did, we did salad dressings. And mm -hmm. one of the groups came in, and I thought I heard somebody say something about like I had sugar and salt, and I was talking about how there's a, it's like nice to have a little bit of sweetness in your dressing. So they were working in. Um, we were working in these smaller groups together in like four different groups and they were going to kind of taste their dressings against each other. And I thought I heard some rumbling and then I didn't think anything of it. And I'm like making the dressing and I kept adding salt to like get that balance right. <laughs> and I was like, it just it doesn't taste salty. Like it's so weird. And I would add some more and I was like, it's just, it's like sweet. It's not salty. And the kids had switched the salt <laughs> and the sugar on me because I had them out in bowls. And I didn't like realize it till like well after I was like, oh my god, that's what they were talking about. Yeah, so, <laughs> they tricked you. So we had this deliciously sweet dressing that couldn't figure out why it wasn't getting salty. Okay, so I think my dressing is ready. Mm -hmm. I like to make it in advance because then the yogurt really soaks up the flavors, the herbs, and the garlic. Um, so I just have about like a cup and a quarter of uh, of the dressing over here. 
um, and I'm just gonna let it sit until we use it. And I have my dressing, like I said, it's a lot thinner. It's like, a, it's, um, it's, it's really light and delicious, which I kind of like in the summer. It's not a real heavy dressing. So it really lets the, um, the vegetables shine through. So I'm gonna actually put up the banner um, of what my proportions ended up being because I did make some adjustments to it. Um, it's one of those things that you kind of do all the time and you don't write down. So uh, two tablespoons of rice vinegar. Um, it's a really nice combination. One tablespoon of um, maple syrup. And it was um, two teaspoons of soy sauce. Two teaspoons of sesame oil. And then salt to taste, which for me was about um, I'd say one eighth of a teaspoon for this one. Didn't need too much because the soy sauce added a bunch. Okay, so I'm gonna add that in, just so, just so you guys have that up. Okay, so we set mine aside. So Renata, um, maybe you wanna walk through kind of like the categories as we go yeah. through. Um, so I think it's always, people always love to go to salad bars because everything is cut and prepared and they put it in categories for you, and you do, sometimes you're not really aware of what category is what and what will go great with another vegetable. Um, so I was, uh, you know, composing this ingredient list. I was trying to uh, uh, to divide it to the different categories, um, and you always want to start um, with some kind of greens, any leafy greens. Although sometimes you don't put any greens, and it's still a wonderful salad. So you know, it's not. Um, there are no rules that you, uh, you know, absolutely need to follow. Um, yeah. And I've got, I've got some interesting, I have some baby kale, huh? which, um, last, for those of you who joined us for, um, the last class in the spring, um, farmer Will, who has, who was talking about starting a farm. Uh, this is his first kale. So there's there's like a little, I love that I'm eating the kale that he harvested. Yeah. He worked so hard for. So I'm doing that. And then I'm adding to that um, some mustard greens, um, mm, which have a little spice to them. They're almost like a little bit of horseradish. Yeah. So I think that'll go nice with the, with the um, you know, the stuff made with, uh, soy dressing. Yeah. Um, I'm also using some kale. Um that I got from the garden. And I'm gonna put a little bit of spinach in here as well. I have, I have not had success growing kale, I have to say. Really? Why, was it eaten before you were able to? Uh... It was eaten and um, I just don't think I do, I, I'm like a lazy gardener. I don't, I need stuff that just like is gonna grow despite of or even better because of my um, unattended, you know, the lack of attention I give everything. <laughs> uh, so like, you know, I remember, I, you know, my, my tomatoes do pretty well. There's not too much you have to do once they start growing. Yeah. My snow peas and my green beans do well. There's not that much you have to do. Yeah. But I, I, my kale was not, you know, it was, I didn't do much. It was a half of it has been eaten by yeah. by what, but you know, they left me a little bit. And then the other thing is that I think I also like to grow things that I, we first of all, that we eat a ton of. Right. Um, and then use farmer's markets for the things I know that they're going to grow better than I'm going to grow. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so you want to have about, for you know, for one serving, um, I have about one cup of uh, greens over here, probably a little bit more, probably closer to two. Um, And then I also got from the guy, I have an uh, overgrown broccoli that I got the flowers. So I'm just going to cut that up a little bit just to add some crunch. Yeah, and, and broccoli flowers and um, kale flowers are really delicious. Um, they kind of taste like broccoli or kale, but with a little bit of the sweetness of the nectar. Yeah. And so it's one of those, um, you know, we had a whole field last year that went to flour and, you know, a lot of people don't buy it, but it's like this fun little product that you can add to salads and 
uh, add to the top. So there's this, you know, I'm actually working on a project with one of the chefs here who um, we're looking at um, foraging from the farm. So, you know, you typically hear of like foraging in the woods, but we're working on looking at products that you can like, you know, like the way garlic scapes, for example, if anybody's familiar with garlic scapes, they're the flower bud of a garlic that's removed by farmers in the, in the spring so that the garlic bulb um, is tricked into thinking that they've already flowered and produced seeds. And so now they'll put all of their energy into making their bulb really big. And so it's what farmers do to make sure that the bulb that they harvest in the fall is really big. Mm. And now it's a wonderful product that needs to be taught. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're taking these walks on the farm and looking at like tomatoes, for example, he was talking about how you can take the prunings of the tomato leaves. Um, you know, like if you prune your tomatoes and have with the leaves, um, you put those in a blender with salt and you can make tomato salt um, that you can like put onto like into salads or onto steak or, um, and it just adds. Are tomato leaves edible? I didn't know they're edible. They are apparently. Yeah. <laughs> So that was kind of cool. And then also you can put it into um, like into an oil to, to, and then your oil has sort of like that tomato wow. smell to it. Yeah. Uh, and I love tomato. I went, you know, when I'm pruning my tomatoes, it just, I just sniff my hands afterwards so much. Yeah. It smells amazing. I'm with you. Yeah. Okay. What next? Uh, okay. So I'm going to add a couple of things from the, the number two uh, list. Uh, which has, uh, I put some, you know, cucumbers, carrots, uh, radishes, mushroom. It's um, colorful uh, vegetables that don't have, you know, overwhelming um, flavor to them. Yeah. Um, I do add a lot of, a lot of crunch. So I'm going to add a couple of radishes and I'm going to try to cut them really thin. Um, so I'm adding carrots, which, oh, these are delicious. Um, these are from the farm as well. And one of the things I think that's so important when you're making a salad, I mean, certainly when you make a salad for yourself, you're just throwing stuff together, it's one thing. But as we think about like the texture and the um, sensory engagement, yeah. Um, like with carrots, I can't stand big discs of carrots in my salad because you can't like get them onto your fork in one bite. Absolutely. What are you doing? Because I also have a trick. I'm going to make little squares. So I'm going to make. Okay. Um, my little sticks and then cut that. I forget what those are called. Okay. Um, but I make sticks and then I cut them into um, sort of like pretty even squares. What do you do? So I peel my carrots and then I keep peeling them. Um, so I have. Um, yeah, you know what's funny? I do that too. I like it, or I grate them. I'll do like yeah. carrots, which I love. And if you go to a salad bar and the salad is grated, I absolutely love it. It also like soaks up the dressing. Yeah, absolutely. So that's funny. I, I love, I should do, I should grate them more, but I do my sort of, I, oh goodness, my culinary yep. word. I forget what these are called. I, I don't know. <laughs> <sighs> well, you cut them into little sticks and then yeah. you gather them together. Oh, Juliet, Juliet. Thank you, Julian. Yeah, I, I was hoping somebody might join in on the comments yeah. on that one. And then I cut them into little squares. Okay. So, um, so these carrots are interesting now. Um, we, uh, the farmer here has stopped growing any vegetables that are um, hybrids. Huh. His most hybrid varieties are patented um, by seed companies, which makes yeah. them private property. And so you can't save the seed from those mm -hmm. carrots. Oh. And there's a lot of like, um, you know, not all hybrids and patented things are necessarily patented by large corporations, but many are. Um, and so it's an interesting take. So like, for example, I always grow mocum carrots, which are really sweet. And uh, they're a variety that we were growing at Stone Barn Center. And um, I'm not sure if they still do, but he was my, our farmer was like, oh no, I don't grow them anymore. Those are patented. Oh. But you, you know, you can buy them on at Johnny's. So it's not like they're, you know, there's, so it's an, it's an interesting take that I am curious. I haven't had a chance to talk to him more. But it's a. Um, it said he's. He said it's really changed his way of thinking about what seeds he's purchasing. And then he's able to use his own seeds for for the next season. So he would. It would allow him the possibility of saving seeds. Yeah. And more of an ethical decision than a practical one. 
Yeah. Um, so I'm using also an heirloom cucumber that he's growing. So it's a lot skinnier. Yeah. So it's like an English cucumber, but I think it's actually a Japanese variety. You know, I'm using, I found a few uh, uh, snow peas in the garden. I'm just going okay, to adding those in. Okay. Uh -huh. and Oh, these are beautiful because they don't have it. They don't have too many seeds in them. Oh, that looks amazing. What are they called? Is it something with like a Y and a Z, like a Yuzo something? I'll find out. I didn't look when I picked them up. It just said heirloom, but I'll find out what they are. They're really because I tried, um, and my cucumbers took forever to grow in the garden, but they're finally growing. And I, I think I also did. I put mine in late, so I, mine are just flowering now. Mine too, which is good because I'm like fully. Um, overwhelmed with snow peas and green beans. So That's if right. I have cucumbers now also, yeah, I don't think that would be good. Um, and then I have a half eaten peach, um, which I'm going to add. So I'm gonna slice it really thin. And it's nice to add some sweetness, uh, especially with nothing with no sweetness. So I thought the peach would be this addition. So I, I'm going to jump in, and I, I know we've still got we've got about ten people watching us right now. Um, and I'm curious if you can comment, if you let us know if any of you are cooking with us. Um, I have to say, there's something. This is new for us to cook like this, and um, I'm really enjoying cooking with you from far away. <laughs> I am too. Hopefully, others are as well. Okay. And so, what do you add? Um, so, was mushrooms was in this list, right? Yeah, you can absolutely add some mushrooms as well. Okay. So another local farmer here who I adore, his name is Chris Pacheco, and he um, has a company called Seacoast Mushrooms. And these were in our farm stand as well. He had some issues this year because most of his clients were um, restaurants. And so when the pandemic hit, he was losing a lot of business because he did he was he grows a ton of mushrooms and you know, I think my town alone, Mystic, he said, eats like 100 or 500 pounds of mushrooms a week or something crazy like that. Because he's all he's in all the, the farm stands and the local um, grocery stores also. And he grows them in these large like containers in his backyard or on his farm. Yeah. Um, but what the chef that I was mentioning before, James, uh, paired up with him and they started making a mushroom falafel mix. Wow. And a mushroom, um, a mushroom burger mix. And they work together like this was a chef farmer collaboration wow. um, to make the because how much you know like a lot of people buy like mushrooms here and there but they're not gonna buy lots and lots of mushrooms right and so they're selling tons of this vegetarian or vegan uh, mushroom mix and falafel mix at their um they have like a storefront where they're selling um like a marketplace and um it was a way for them to buy all these mushrooms that they would have sold to restaurants to create a product you know, to process something, but it's so what, do they dry the mushrooms and can kind of um, process them somehow? What how yeah, so the rest so the the re this you know, restaurant essentially who ne which now is functioning as a market yeah. um, uh, buys all the mushrooms from him or buys a ton of mushrooms from him and then turns those mushrooms into the falafel mix and the yeah. Um, in addition to selling the mushrooms raw, yeah. it's, just a, it's just another. Can you it online? I really want to try it. Uh, you can't. I'll have to. We'll, have, we'll figure out how to get it to you. I tried the mushroom mix. It was a little spicy. Yeah. And, um, I have to think about whether I would use it as a burger. Like I'm not sure. It. it I I really loved it, but it wasn't. But I don't like veggie. Bur I mean, if I'm gonna have a burger, I want a burger. But I would add. I actually would cook it and add it to a salad. It was like. Oh. With like cayenne hmm. and um it was it was delicious actually but it was just it was I, I had to think about how i would use it as opposed to like on a bun which wasn't how i wanted it huh. so i'm adding um king oyster mushrooms which are these really great um mushrooms because the stems are um very soft so you can, yeah. you, know, you can eat the stems raw and they're not tough at all and so they make it really nice that I'm making almost like a chopped salad. So all my, all my cucumbers and my carrots and my mushrooms are all kind of the same. The same size. Yeah. I think that's also important in a salad that because there's not like a one big chunk of something and then another vegetable is cut really small. So you have, um, you know, things are probably evenly cut more or less. Yeah. And uh, Jill said she decided to make gazpacho, which 
is so good. And I'm looking at this cucumber, Jill, and thinking like a cucumber gazpacho would be amazing right now. Um, I love your recipe. And it is, you're right, it is almost a salad. It's like basically taking these ingredients and blending them and just, you know, I, we don't have any um, tomatoes on the farm yet, but as soon as the tomatoes come in, I really do love gazpacho. Okay, so what next now? Um, so now um, you have an option of one of the following, which I look at as one special ingredient that will make the salad really taste, uh, you know, stand out. Um, and I gave a few options, an avocado or some uh, uh, roasted nuts or hearts of palm or olives, something that's gonna give, you know, have a lot of flavor um, and make a difference. Um, and I'm having a hard time deciding what I'm gonna add for this category. I have an avocado here. Um, I think I'm gonna add the avocado. I think it's gonna, it's gonna go well with the flavor. And it's a pretty large avocado, so I'm just going to uh, take a quarter off of it. Um, and Renata, Javier was wondering how long the yogurt dressing will last in the fridge? Oh, this will, well, this will last a few days, um, up to a week. Okay, and yeah. I'm gonna, um, I when I came home, I, I went home um, at like one o'clock to three for like I had to take a little bit of a, of a parent shift. Yeah, uh, we just got a break and then um, came back. But when I got home, he had roasted some zucchini oh. and flour, which he's like constantly roasting vegetables, which I like because I have roasted vegetables. But he yeah. leaves the roasting pan for me. Yeah. But I, I have some um, delicious roasted um, zucchini, which was like kind of perfect for. Yeah. Uh, so this category is, you know, anything special. Yeah. Um, and there's so many different things that you can put in. Um, yeah. Um, Kathy's saying she, uh, she's making it. Um, lemon juice, garlic, salt, pepper, olive oil. One of my favorites. Yeah. Okay, I have my avocado in here. Okay, I've got my zucchini. And then for a protein, um, which you don't always have to put a protein in a salad, um, but if you're really looking at, at looking at it as a you know a, a nice meal to have in the middle of the day, it's nice to have some protein. And I'm just like have a hard boiled egg um, that I'm going to cut into. So I cut it into two, and then each one I cut it into four. So I, I kind of remember that our um, can opener is broken. So I have I have um, chickpeas here, but I may have to. I think I'm gonna have to skip them. Okay. So our, our can opener broke. <laughs> I'd forgotten. <laughs> it's been a while since I cooked in this kitchen. Yeah. Yeah, I'll bring that home. Okay. All right. So I'm actually going to add, I'll add some pumpkin seeds instead. Yeah. Oh, that's, a great, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And you know, it's funny, that was that came up in the, um, yeah, in the Dr. Ramsey. Yeah. And I was like, oh, right. Pumpkin yeah. seeds perfect. So because it just has a crunch and flavor and has protein. It's just, it's great all around. Yeah. So I'm going to add those in. And I think this is where my, this salad, like being intentional about this salad is it, so different than like, you know, when I make a salad for lunch, I sometimes feel really underwhelmed and like still really hungry. Yeah. I haven't thought about all these components. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So the next thing I'm going to put, I'm going to put some of my uh, bulgur that it soaked up all of the water and it's, it looks like couscous that you cooked, but it's not couscous. It's just the wheat. I am going to squeeze it. So um, all the extra water. Uh, we're going to get rid of because we wanted it to soak up the flavor of the dressing and not be watery. Okay. Um, and I'm squeezing it. I'm putting it on top. I'm just doing like a couple of handfuls. And then I'm going to add some um, flax seeds, which I add to my granola, but I was thinking like, why not just... Yeah. You know, I, 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 was, I was definitely inspired by, um, you know, the Dr. Ramsey video, just kind of like the more variety and you know the the, the number the adding lots of different things to your diet in a day where i might just make like a kale salad or you know and maybe add a kale and tomatoes like this is such a 
this is just so much more nourishing by remembering, like, you're right, I have the flax seeds, I have the pumpkin seeds. Right. Okay. Hands. Um, I'm going to get some spoons to. We're ready, we're ready to do the dressing, right? Yeah. Okay, we're there. Okay. And Dana said she's cooking along as well. Yeah, the leftover sweet potato. You know, roasted squash in a salad is also unbelievable or sweet potato. I, it's one of those things where, you know, this whole pandemic cooking for me has been about remembering that I, you know, like these things are in the fridge, like I'll make a salad or I'll, you know, make my pizza and be like, oh, right, I have this like leftover, you know, whatever I cooked, like if I made like a sausage dish the night before you throw it on the pizza and it's a thing. thing that goes to that intuition, but also the idea of just kind of using what you have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I love adding uh, roasted sweet potatoes to salad. Yeah. All right, let me get my fork. I'm gonna taste it and see if it needs any correction. Oh, and then I forgot, I'm gonna add my um, kelp. Oh, wow. uh, so Susie, who joined us uh, the last time we had a class, is um, a kelp farmer and she uh, dries kelp and then has been making these products. This is, she makes like kelp flakes that you can sprinkle onto things, which just adds this delicious flavor. And then she's been making this, um, it's a vegan, again, we'll have to find out what it is, a furikake, F-U-R-I-K-A-K-E. And it is sesame seeds and um, kelp and salt and a little bit of sugar. So I'm gonna sprinkle that on my salad as a final seasoning. Um, and kelp, what's so great about it is, um, I'm just reading here just so I don't miss anything. So it's a natural source of vitamin A, B1, B2, C, D, and E. And then also minerals, um, including zinc, iodine, magnesium, iron, potassium, copper, and calcium. And it says it contains the highest natural concentration of calcium of any food. Oh. 10 times more than milk. So it just goes to show, like, just again, like, the you know, adding and, and sort of, like, diversifying and sort of opening up to new ingredients is pretty amazing. Yeah. Okay. So I'm putting that together. I will eat right out of my bowl as well. Yeah. Adding a little bit more dressing. Okay, and I don't have my clear bowl today, but. Oh, that looks gorgeous. And I hope people will share pictures. Yeah. Mm. So I do love the um, yogurt dressing, but. This is, like I said, this has become such a favorite of mine. Yeah. Because it's so refreshing and light. And light, yeah. It's And it, um, it, it like hits on all the flavor bells. Like when I'm craving, for me, my cravings are always like salty. Uh, and I really love Japanese flavorings. And I, and this just kind of hits all those notes. Mm. Well, <laughs> Not to talk and eat at the same time. Um, this was really fun, Renata. I'm, I'm glad we're working together. Yeah, I miss you. I miss you too. And um, I'm glad that um, that you that those who are watching have been able to watch and maybe we'll um, cook later. And, and um, again, like think about the intentionality of the ingredients, the um, kind of intuition of like, will this work together? Let's see. Let's try it out. Right. Um, using up what you have left over. Um, you know, adding in from, you know, some beans and some veggies and kind of trying to really mix it up with what you're adding. Um, and then, um, and then the sensory component of like really being intentional with how you chop your vegetables or whether it's grated or, you know, chopped in big pieces or tiny little pieces. I mean, I even love chopped salad where the salad greens are really small. Right. Um, so those those things really change your experience. Yeah, completely. Um, all right. We have yeah. I know this is, this is perfect. Um, 
we are um, not together tomorrow. So um, we will see everybody again on Thursday at nine. Thank you for your patience with the technical difficulties. I had set the video to private, but I'm, it was meant to be sent to, doesn't matter. I changed the setting and I'll make sure that doesn't happen for the next time. So my apologies for any difficulties getting on. And um, we'll have the Zoom link up so that it's easy to access on Thursday morning. Yeah. And we have the ingredients um, for the recipes on Thursday. We'll put it on Thursday. Looking forward to it. Okay. All right. Bye, Renata. Bye. Bye, everybody.